Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Parkstone Baptist Church for Sunday morning the 17th of January 2021. This is church in the love of God and despite COVID-19. These words of Psalm 27 turn our faces towards the face of life, light and love that we know to be that of our Lord and God. And we'll be with these words in this first part before we move on to our main Bible reading for today, which continues in the first letter of John. The psalm says, declares, rejoices, confesses, the Lord is my light and he saves me. Why should I fear anyone? The Lord is my place of safety. Why should I be afraid? My enemies are evil. They will trip and fall when they attack me and try to swallow me up. But even if an army attacks me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if war breaks out against me, I will still trust in God. I'm asking the Lord for only one thing. Here is what I want. I want to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to look at the beauty of the Lord. I want to worship him in his temple. When I'm in trouble, he will keep me safe in his house. He will hide me in the safety of his holy tent. He will put me on a rock that's very high. And then I will win the battle over my enemies who are all around me. At his holy tent, I will offer my sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, Hear my voice when I call out to you. Treat me with kindness and answer me. My heart says, seek him. Lord, I will seek you. Don't turn your face away from me. Don't turn away because you are angry. You have helped me. God, my Saviour, don't say no to me. Don't desert me. My father and my mother may desert me, but the Lord will accept me. Lord, teach me your ways. Lead me along a straight path. There are many people who treat me badly. My enemies want to harm me, so don't turn me over to them. Witnesses who tell lies are rising up against me. They say all sorts of evil things about me. But here is something I'm still sure of. I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm still alive. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and don't lose hope. Wait for the Lord. Well, let's pray together as we have been praying uh, all this time that we've been living with the scourge of coronavirus. Our God and Father, in worship, whether together or apart, may we know we are in your presence and that your love binds us together in one human family gathered and parted on this Lord's day, this day of life and light, may we trust that nothing in all creation will ever separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who for our sakes died and rose again. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Amen. And let's join our prayers with those of all the church as we say in the faith, hope and love of Christ, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And so, dear Father, for daily bread, grace and mercy, even the forgiveness of our sins and daily deliverance, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, the Son you gave for us all, that with the Holy Spirit's help, we may ever serve your purpose, love your will and praise your name. Amen. It's a real delight that Faye has been able to write our 
Sunday in intercessions for us. And uh, in these video services, we're perhaps uh, praying a bit more briefly than we would do in church and at um, other times. Uh, but I'm really grateful to Faye for thinking uh, and for praying, um, even as now we pray her words. Heavenly Father, you call us to speak to you in prayer even when the places we would usually go are not available. Help us know your Spirit's presence wherever we pray. Today, we especially pray for those who are living in fear. Give them your strength. And for those who have not yet realised the urgency of the situation, protect them and all of us from harm. Lord God, we think of the troubled parts of the world where there is so much suffering even before the pandemic started. For those without homes and food, for those living in fear of war and conflict, and for those whose humanity is denied by others, we pray you'll be with them, Lord. We pray for the church in all its forms and traditions, especially in those parts of the world where it faces open hostility and violence. Give courage and faith to its leaders and support all its members through whatever adversity they face. And we pray for the church here in Parkstone and all who giveth their time and talents in Christ's name. We pray for all in need at this time, in body, mind or spirit, that you will be with them all. Almighty God, may your presence be seen clearly in everything we do and say each day throughout the coming week. We pray that your joy and your love will flow freely in us and through us as we follow where you lead us. May the blessing of God's love rest and remain with us and all we have prayed for. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Faye. God be with you too. And so we read, uh, uh, reading back to where we were Last time in this first letter of John. Uh, and we hear again John writing and saying, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And he takes a little step out which and then comes back but the little step out is the life was manifest and we have seen it and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and was made manifest to us and then stepping back in that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him. We make God and his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our hearts, a liar, and his word is not in us. Your mobile uh, pings, hoots, whistles, you pick up, an acquaintance has sent you a photo. Let's say it, they've considerately sent you a selfie to make the point that they are A, lying on a sunbed, browning their toes by a poolside, or B, enjoying a plateful of exotic food in a tropical location, or C, showing off their I can water ski on one leg stunt at some, Mediter at some Mediterranean resort, or D, cruising the Caribbean without Hurricane Harry in sight. While you, A, 
languish at home eating a cheese sandwich, or B, a stuck in the same old day job, or C, a confined to quarters by the cold, or D, are confined to quarters with a cold. I don't know if you heard a bang just now, but that was somebody out in the cold banging on the window, but, uh, but I think I can deal with that in some other way. I hope, otherwise this recording will end now. And to that photo, to that photo of whatever it is that they're doing and that you are not, they have added the words like salt to a wound, live in the life. Thoughtful, isn't it? If there's a plus side to COVID, maybe it's fewer photo ops for avid posters of those thought of you, but look, hey, look at me, selfies. The living the life tag um, poses the question, is this the life? Or should we look for something different? If it is the life, it's not one available to the vast majority of the world's people at any time in any year, COVID or not. This year and last, well, it's not been the life for many of those who'd got accustomed to it. Um, there we are, because of COVID. If we didn't know it before, we know it now. Life is more than a place in the sun. Many people have discovered to maybe great surprise and, and often to great joy there is more to life through this season of coronavirus more to life as they were knowing it and living it this hasn't been possible for everyone but many have shared their delight at discovering nature's wonders in their back garden or in walking streets they'd only driven along and by helping people who've been stuck indoors even so is even this living the life or is there more Last time, John introduced us to the eternal life that had appeared. This was the life that he and others had seen with their eyes, heard with their ears and touched with their hands. Jesus wrote of Jesus, the eternal word, who became flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, blood of our blood. The word Jesus is like the word Jesus. The word Jesus um, is the word, well, I don't know what I've, typed here. I've made a bit of a mess of this one here. But the word uh, Jesus is like the word Jesus speaks life to all who believe and receive him. John defined the life as fellowship with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. That's in verse 3 of his letters uh, chapter 1. He said this because that's how Jesus himself had celebrated the life in his prayer before the cross, whereby his death and sacrifice he made the life available to the world. And Father, this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life, as spoken about by Jesus, is not so much about duration as if Endless life is all that matters. Could endless days be even endured for that matter, or matter if that's all there is to eternal life? I can understand people who say they wouldn't want to live forever if that's all it is. Yet I'm not sure that they understand eternal life. I'm not sure that they yet know it. Would they feel differently? if they knew the God that this life is. Great friendships, vintage marriages, the most enduring and enjoyable of human relationships are ended at death. Sadness and sorrow, grief and pain are attached to those endings like a leech to living tissue. In some ways, COVID has introduced a kind of living death Ooh, a zombieish existence. I don't altogether exaggerate. Loved ones, family and friends have experienced separation in ways only caused, generally speaking, by events like war, emigration to a distant country or service overseas until satellite and cellular communications help to ease a little 
the pains of being apart. Eternal life, as described and delighted in by Jesus, is altogether different to the life dismissed when people won't listen to God's Son, who knew this life and gave this life to extend it to us. Eternal life, according to Jesus, passed on by faithful companion John, is to enjoy endless love. Eternal life is to enter into the love shared between the Father and the Son in the eternal bond of the Holy Spirit. That's why very early on in COVID, when I was doing the videos, not looking out into the garden as most of them were over a lot of last year, but still at home and occasionally in church as it is from time to time, um, I've always placed this little bit of soapstone carving, carving there, the dance of the three. It could be three people. But I've liked to think of it as the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, into whose company and fellowship we are invited and included by his great grace shown us in Christ his Son. Eternal life, according to Jesus, is an enduring relationship. It is an eternal communion, an abiding fellowship, an intimate knowing, unassailable by death, imperishable by its divine origin and source, invincible by any evil, immortal, because the one who supplies it and sustains it moment by moment and through all eternity is himself immortal, even though he suffered death in order to offer it to us. Stay with us, pleaded two people with the stranger who'd walked home with them. Lord, let us put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, insisted Peter. Peter and Cleopas and companion didn't consider life with Jesus or fellowship with God's saints as insufferably boring or as, un or as unbearable suffering. They longed for more, not less. A thousand ages in their sight would have been like an evening gone. And what an evening! <laughs> Eternal life is not only this loving relationship, it is more and then some. But it is nothing without this. This fellowship of our dear father with his dear children through his dear son is to eternal life what the heart is to the warm blood flowing through our bodies, the gushing source to the stream, the oxygen to our lungs and the radiant sun to the light of day. Speaking of light, so does John. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But let's uh, break away for a moment perhaps whether you pop to the loo or make a cuppa or pause to pray or stand up and praise the Lord. I'll leave it to you and I guess I'll never know. Are you back? God is light. There are only two places in the Bible, 66 books, where someone says God is in quite that way. I'm sure you know both, even if you can't put your finger on book, chapter, verse. Both are in John's letter number one. First, God is light here in chapter one, verse five. And second, God is love in chapter four, verse 16. When John says God is light, he doesn't mean it the way the psalmist said as we began, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The psalmist meant that God was as a lamp in the darkness, for God saved him from his fears, that is evil doers and enemies, in verse 2 of the psalm, and as I think verses 9 to 10 suggest, from his own sins and the troubles he got himself into. Light in Psalm 27 is something God provides for his people. He scatters the darkness of sin, evil and death to take away our fear. Uh, whether that light comes as forgiveness, whether it comes as salvation from sin, salvation from enemies, uh, uh, you know, it comes in so many ways, truth uh, to lead and to guide. However, correct as well. However, John means light 
not so much as what God does, but as what God is. God is light. Not light is God, which is what some have said and some say, different times, different places around the world, different peoples. That's the wrong way round view we see when we make something created, a creature, even as light is, into God. But God is light. What is John saying? What he's not saying is that we take a bright idea of our own about light and make this what John means and, you know, kind of read into the text, read on to scripture, read on to light, all sorts of things that we might know about light or have experienced about it. Like saying, and this is daft, nothing travels faster than light so no one's faster than God, which I suppose you could say, but it's hardly John's point. Did John even consider the speed of light? Probably not. But what John did think about was glimpses when God revealed something of his own nature and being to people whose experience is recounted in the scriptures. When we pay attention to what God disclosed to them, we see three things. We see the light of God's glory. God is light. The light of God's glory is such that nobody can approach it, enter it or penetrate it. Paul gives praise to God in his first letter to Timothy as the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. And Paul says this because, well, that was the shared experience of Moses, Exodus 33, Isaiah, Isaiah 6, and Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1. Remember, Paul had had his own blinding light experience too. Acts 9 tells about it. The dazzling light of God's glory revealed God's presence. However, at the same time, God concealed himself, hid himself from the radiance, because no one saw God. No one can see me and live, the Lord said to Moses. And John echoed at the start of his gospel, nobody has ever seen God. It takes God to show God. It takes God to show God. And this is what Jesus alone could do, because he is God the Son. On the mountain of transfiguration, Peter, James and John saw the shining glory Moses, Isaiah and Ezekiel saw, but they too didn't see God. They did, however, see Jesus might be good to read Luke's telling of the tale in Luke 9 from verse 28 and especially verse 36 where Luke makes it very plain that that they saw Jesus and Jesus alone and all the focus in looking and listening to know of, of God was to be done with him and through him and by him. The light of God shines in our hearts and on our faces, Paul would write to the Corinthians, through Jesus Christ. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, uh, all over the place, but especially verses 3 to 6 of chapter 4. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. John says we can come into the light, into the glory, walk in the light and stay in the light. We can have fellowship with our God and Saviour, sharing this with many sisters and brothers. Far from being excluded from the light of God's glory, we are included in Christ. A second thing going on from the light as God's glory is the light of God's truth. God is light. The light of God's truth is impeccable, unimpeachable, invariable and utterly reliable. I won't mention the name of a man in the news who is none of these things. Let the reader understand, as uh, Mark said about words of Jesus in Mark chapter 13. Though every man were false, Paul cried, let God be true, Romans 3, 4. God is true. I don't mean this so much as, you know, 
does God exist? Yes, he does. That's that's the truth, you know, that kind of way of thinking and talking. But in the way perhaps we think when we talk about two good women and men and true, you know, it's something about them. They're a character, they're a, they're a being, their nature, uh, who they are as individuals and as a group. God is true, true to himself, true to his own nature and being true to his glory, purpose and praise, and therefore true to his word, true to his people, and thus totally to be trusted. God is true. God's, what I would call totally or utterly trustworthy trueness, was something of which Jesus wanted nobody to have any doubt. Our Lord said of the Father, he loved and knew and came to make known. He who sent me is true. He who sent me is true. That's John 8 26. John said this at a moment and in a chapter of his gospel when truth was the hot topic as Jesus' adversaries accumulated to attack in verses 12 to 29. And Jesus' so well known words at the outset of this meeting, I am the light of the world, weren't received as calamine, that's what my mum and dad used to put on our sore skin after a day at the beach back before we had quite the sort of sun products we have these days. Uh, but when we got back home, peeling off that skin or trying to avoid that, perhaps slapping on the pink calamine, oh my word, what a relief that was, Wond wondrous stuff. Jesus' well-known words at the outset of this meeting weren't received as calamine on sun, sun sore skin, but like a match to dry grass. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, there were men there who were determined, determined, to squeeze their eyes shut against the light, meeting them in person, to offer them the truth of his life, deeds and words, as the light to lead them through the darkness of life and death. They didn't want to know. Their minds were closed, their eyes shut, their ears uh, uh, sealed. Uh, it, it's not something we think about really. Jesus' words in John 8, 12, being, as it were, the spark that set a deadly blaze alight. There's a lot of challenge in them. Because as Jesus says elsewhere, and you'll have to track this down in a John's John's Gospel, because I didn't, didn't put this in the notes, and uh, just for the moment, my mind's not... <laughs> Not sort of picking them up, but uh, but his words about you know you know the light has come, but men preferred darkness rather than light and didn't want to come into the light because their deeds were evil and they didn't want to be exposed. You know the light comes to to show us the darkness in our world and in our lives in order that we might be rid of it, forgiven it, brought out of it. But you know people like the dark, a bit like those insects. Not that I blame them, but when you lift a stone and all the little wood lice and all the rest of it, centipedes and things, they scatter, don't they? They don't like the light. Well, you know, that's 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 their nature. That's not about sin. But when human beings do that, when faced with the light and love and truth of Christ, uh, it's a very sad thing when they scatter and scurry away. Worse, when they pick up the stone and hurl it at him. Anyway, which is what happens towards the end of that chapter, in effect. Uh, I've sort of digressed, so I just hope I can pull myself back because uh, my brain has a bit of a problem with digressions and pulling back these days. Send forth your light and your truth, the uh, psalmist uh, cried. Let them be my guide, Psalm 43, verse 3. God's light and truth are virtually virtual synonyms, different names for the same thing. And God's clearest, fullest answer to that heart's cry is Jesus, his son. When Jesus leads us to the Father, he leads us to one who is true and can be trusted. 
just as he himself is true and to be trusted, as Peter, John, Cleopas and companion well knew. And here's the thing. Here's, here's the glorious, wonderful, gracious, marvellous thing. John says, we can join the company. We can come into communion with the truth, with the light in person, or better, with the eternal persons of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, our God, one God, forever and ever. We can live in the, we can live in the light of the one who is true through and through, whose fellowship will never fail or be forgotten or forsaken, never in life, and no, not ever at death. This life, this fellowship, is as lasting as the God who makes it so. And the third thing about light, you know, the light of God's glory, the light of God's truth, is the light of God's holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee, the hymn begins and goes on to say, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. That was not a point about which anyone who was brought face to face with the radiant light of God's presence had to be persuaded. They knew it. They felt it. They fell apart, burst apart at the thought. They felt the pressure of the light of God on their own mental and spiritual darkness caused by sin. Moses knew it as he approached the blazing bush that was not burnt. He trod on holy ground and could come no closer. Read all about it in Exodus 3. The Israelites knew it as the mountain of the Lord in the wilderness blazed with the glory of the Lord and neither man nor beast was to set foot on the mountain on pain of death. Read about it in Exodus 19. And Isaiah knew it as his soul unzipped at the seams at a glimpse of the fringes of the Lord's holy glory blazing through the dark clouds overwhelming his people that he described at the end of the previous chapter it's good to read back sometimes isn't it a bit isaiah 5 30 into into the chapter 6 and and to verse 5 and simon peter knew it when he saw the light depart from me lord for i am a sinful man lord i am not worthy said that soldier to have you come under my roof, into my house, through my door, and sit down at table with me. The searing, holy light of God's presence is an environment alien to us as sinners. It is hostile to sin. Rightly so. We cannot survive it, let alone thrive in it. And, and here's the thing. Here's the third thing that is really just one thing. John says, we may walk in the holy light of God's presence. The unholy can be called holy and become holy. The unimaginable and impossible has been made possible. <laughs> imagine, and don't just imagine, you can come and walk in the light. We too can come. I'm picking up, uh, metaphorically, but also uh, actually, uh, words of Paul and give thanks to the Father who has qualified us, the so unqualified, utterly disqualified, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light by delivering us from the dominion, the domain of darkness and transferring us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, that is, the forgiveness of sins. You know, those words about transferring us from the domain of darkness or the dominion of darkness always remind me of that hymn we have been singing, I think, ever since I've been here. Without fail, on Easter Sunday morning at the early uh, communion, um, La Robert Lowry's hymn that, uh, you know, sort of begins, Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Saviour, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. And then that sort of transforming moment in sort of music and uh, words and, and, and emotion and everything uh, uh, where we sing, 
up from the grave he arose. Uh, I'm not singing it. Uh, with a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. You know, this Colossians 1, straight. He arose, he arose. Alleluia, Christ arose. Uh, you know, glorious, glorious stuff, glorious words. It's always a delight to sing. And, and I, do you know, I'm only carrying on a tradition. Uh, you know, when did I ever invent anything original? You know, you know when do any of us really? You know, you know, it's there somewhere in some shape or form, inherent within creation or, or simply in some way repeating, reiterating what others have thought, said, done. You know, we're just developing, extending, expanding. But anyway, uh, I, I, but I go back to my youth and to my very dear pastor, Eric, Eric Eyre, um, who I think... Um, uh, uh, you know, amongst some other Easter hymns, love that one, and and uh, certainly got us singing it at um, Easter tide and uh, uh, other times uh, too at, at Romsey Baptist Church. So, we too can be living the life, not on a uh, Riviera, but in the light nonetheless in the eternal not passing and temporary transitory momentary uh, light and life of lives in this present world in this present existence in the present ways that people know it but we too can be living the life in the eternal light and love of God through his son with all his people by the fellowship of the eternal spirit as Hebrew 9's Hebrews 9 14 speaks of the Holy Spirit himself who is the bond, who is the, the connector, as it were. As they say these days, what is there not to like? Better, what kind of love is this, glorious, true and holy, that welcomes you and me to know it now and forever? Well, is there a catch? Sadly, with some things, even when we're told, they're not. There turns out to be. Is there a catch? Is this life too good to be true? No. There is no catch. But once we have accepted the invitation that bears our name, this fellowship is not something to abuse. And this life, this new life, is not something we take for granted, as John was determined to point out. That's for next time, maybe, I, I I hope we can return to this. This time, let's rejoice in the invitation. Let's not leave it on the mantelpiece wherever you stick things. Let's reply and let's go and live the life in the one fellowship that will never, ever end. Now, Thomas Binney's hymn usually sung to the tune Newcastle, um, which I'll have for you in a bit, is to my knowledge the best hymn yet to express today's theme. Uh, you know, it kind of goes, um, but, but I will come back to it at the end. La 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 how pure the soul must be when placed within your searching sight. It does not fear, but with delight can face such majesty. The spirits who surround your throne may bear that burning bliss, but that is surely theirs alone, since they have never, never known a fallen world like this. Oh, how shall I, whose dwelling here is dark, whose mind is dim, before a holy God appear and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated being. There is a way for us to rise to that sublime abode, an offering and a sacrifice, a Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. 
such grace prepares us for the sight of holiness above the child of ignorance and night may dwell in the eternal light through thy eternal love wondrous words of thomas binney this prayer of william bright that's a nice surname bill bright bright bill our god who has brought us near to a countless company of angels and to the spirits of just men and women made perfect. Perfect. Grant that during our earthly pilgrimage we may abide in their fellowship and in our heavenly country come to share in their everlasting joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray as we have been doing. United in Christ through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit caught up into this wondrous, wondrous relationship and communion. May we continue to rejoice in the love that conquers all, in the faith that overcomes all, and in the hope for all who come and put their trust in you, through Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. And so with thanks and praise in our hearts for life and light, and you may like to wonder why scripture, generally speaking, puts it in that order. I'm not going to talk about that or answer it now but you might like to think about it because generally speaking we think it's the other way around there needs to be light in order for there to be life but generally speaking in Genesis in John 1 that's not the way around the life precedes the light hmm. think about that one but we say with faith love and hope May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, this wondrous, wondrous bond, union, communion we've been caught up into, be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. So, uh, until we meet again in this fellowship of the Holy Spirit, God bless and goodbye. And some music to end with. And it is Newcastle, the tune for Eternal Light, Eternal Light. And let the hearers understand this is for Alan. Listen for that bass line, Alan. It's a, it's a good one. And we've got to give it a go sometime. God be with you, Alan, uh, Keith and Helen. But also, oh, dear, I'm shaking. Uh, yeah. All you, my dear brothers and sisters, in Christ. Amen. Just listen for it.